Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the eighth and final Great Decisions Program, uh, the Western, uh, the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. Uh, wow, hard to believe it's uh, eighth and last, but thank you for hanging with us through wind and snow and sleet and hail, and thankfully today, uh, sunny weather, so you could be with us today. I'm Michael Vendetta, and I'm the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council. On behalf of my colleagues, Erica Kubik and Rachel Brooks, and the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council, thank you for coming, and thank you to many of you who have been with us for all eight weeks, or close to eight weeks. That's great. Uh, we appreciate our online audience, too. Welcome wherever you are watching. And you're, of course, always welcome to join in dialogue by asking questions online. We're pleased to host the series at Grand Rapids Community College and are so grateful to President Charles Lepper, uh, to Mike DeVivo, our faculty liaison, to Class Quant and his uh, AV team. They've been gracious hosts. Hope you've enjoyed coming here this year, and we surely have. It's Council's mission to empower the people and organizations of West Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world. We do that with the help of our corporate partners, our colleges and university partners, and all of you. You can um, be a member of the World Affairs Council simply by signing up on our website, and many of our individual members also become senator members, and they support our work with a donation during the year. We believe that to change the world, one must first know the world, and that's certainly what the series is all about and what we're all about, and you can learn more about what we do at worldmichigan.org. We're grateful to Wolverine Worldwide for being our series sponsor, to WGVU Public Media as our presenting media sponsor, the Community Media Center for Communications Assistance, and to Friends of the World Affairs Council for being tonight's topic sponsorship. We're so pleased tonight to host David Cartwright, the University of Notre Dame. David, thank you for, for coming. Glad that we had nice weather for you to travel up from South Bend today, and thanks for taking the time to be with us in West Michigan. After David's presentation, there's time for questions, and you know house rules that you ask respectful and succinct questions so that uh, we uh, allow our speaker to give us uh, his answers, and we allow as many people to ask questions as possible. Um, I am grateful to have my colleague, Dr. Erica Kubik, who is the empresario of the World Affairs Council's Great Decisions Program, tracking down David and all of our speakers. I want to thank Erica for her outstanding work. And she gets the honor of introducing our final Great Decision Speaker of the series. Erica. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we welcome David Courtright, Professor Emeritus at the Kroc Institute for World Peace in the University of Notre Dame. Courtright is the author or co-editor of more than 20 books, including the volume Waging Peace in Vietnam and Governance for Peace, which was selected by choice as an outstanding academic title of the year. He's also the editor of Peace Policy, an online journal published by the Kroc Institute. He blogs at davidcourtright.net. Other works include Peace, a History of Movements and Ideas, and with George A. Lopez, a co-edited series of major works on multilateral sanctions, including Smart Sanctions, Sanctions in the Search for Security, and the Sanctions Decade. Courtright has written widely about nonviolent social change, nuclear disarmament, and the use of multilateral sanctions and incentives as tools of international peacemaking. He has provided research services to the foreign ministries of Canada, Denmark, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Switzerland, and has served as consultant or advisor to agencies of the United Nations, the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict, the International Peace Academy, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. His presentation tonight is titled, Can Sanctions Help Ukraine? Let's welcome David Courtright. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for spending, spending part of your evening with us as we wrestle with this important topic. Uh, what I want to do this evening is first uh, give a quick introduction to some of my recent work, but then really hone in on this question of sanctions. Uh, how do they work? What do we know about sanctions? 
in general, uh, and then look really in detail at the sanctions that have been imposed uh, against Russia in support of Ukraine, uh, and talk about whether those sanctions are working or not, and how we even know, and what can be done about ways to make those sanctions perhaps more effective. Uh, and then uh, at the third section, briefly, I want to talk about the role of sanctions in diplomacy and negotiation, and talk about what a diplomatic solution to the Ukraine war might look like, how sanctions can be part of that. And I do want to also say a word about China and the role of China, which is country is so much in the news these days. Um, but I'll begin with uh, a bit of shameless self-promotion, if I might. Uh, my newest book is this uh, volume, A Peaceful Superpower, uh, Lessons from the World's Largest Anti-War Movement. Uh, it's a topic that's very relevant to today. We've had many discussions over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's 20 years since that beginning of that fateful uh, invasion and occupation of Iraq. Uh, and my book talks about the massive worldwide opposition to the war uh, and the reasons why so many people in this country and all around the world were opposed uh, to the war. So that's, that could be a topic for another discussion. And if, uh, in the Q&A, if anyone wants to bring it up, uh, we can. But uh, so let's just get right into our topic here. And what do we know about sanctions and how can we apply that knowledge then to the Iraq case, uh, to the Ukraine case. Um, so as Erica mentioned in her introduction, I've done a number of works on sanctions. Uh, and in these remarks, I'm very much channeling my colleague, Professor George Lopez uh, at the Kroc Institute. Often, George does these lectures on sanctions. But over the last year, he's been working at the United Nations in the panel of experts for the North Korea sanctions. Uh, so he's kind of got uh, a muzzle, you know, he can't speak uh, publicly, uh, so I'm his able substitute, or trying to be. Uh, but George and I did this work starting in the 90s and into the 2000s, uh, and mostly about the first uh, Iraq war and the sanctions that were imposed on Iraq. And we tried to uh, bring together the best research and scholarship from our, our community at Notre Dame, but really globally, to understand uh, the dynamics of sanctions. And I'll go through some of the findings of our studies here at the first part of my remarks. And our probably the most recognized book was The Sanctions Decade. And we thought at the time, well, this was a, a new phenomenon that you had multilateral sanctions being used uh, in a way that hadn't been previously, uh, starting with Iraq, but with Yugoslavia and many other cases. Uh, and this was unique, so it was a decade. Uh, but now we've actually continued. and. There are just as many, in fact, more sanctions imposed than there were back then. Uh, and we've really entered a sanctions era. And politically, whenever there's a problem, it seems, uh, our political leaders in Washington and Congress and in federal government, the first thing they do is impose sanctions. It's sort of the go-to option. When you want to do something about a problem, slap on some sanctions. Uh, and it's almost become uh, a mania. and it's. Uh, as Richard House wrote, is sort of sanctions madness, because we now in the US have imposed sanctions on about two thirds of the world. Uh, and, uh, and as you'll see in a moment, the sanctions we've imposed on Russia are unprecedented in their scope uh, and intensity. And never has there been an attempt to impose sanctions on such a huge country. It covers 11 time zones and one of the biggest GDPs in the world. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, an age where we are imposing sanctions very often and, frankly, don't always think about what they can do or can't do. Uh, so just a, a few of the basic findings that uh, Professor Lopez and I have uh, developed over the years, and we're not the only ones, of course, on this. There's a, a large community of sanctioned scholars now internationally. When we started our work on this topic in the 90s, there were, it was a kind of a lonely club, but now there are many uh, conferences, and a number of colleagues of mine were just at the International Studies Association uh, in Canada, and there were a number of big workshops. And some of my comments tonight are informed by uh, what we heard in those workshops just a couple weeks ago. Uh, but uh, we, there's confusion about sanctions as punishment versus persuasion. So often we think about it as punishment. So 
We don't like something that Iran is doing or North Korea or China, so we slap on sanctions. We'll get those guys, we'll teach them a lesson, uh, and don't realize that actually it's got to be seen as a political instrument of persuasion. Uh, and it's, it's both punishment and persuasion, and thinking about the two together is really important. Uh, we also need to understand that uh, the amount of economic pain that is imposed through sanctions doesn't translate automatically into political gain. Uh, one of our books is entitled Pain and Gain. Uh, because a state can suffer tremendous sanctions for a very long period of time and not budge one inch in its policies. You know, the sanctions, the US unilateral sanctions on Cuba is a perfect example. 60 years and Cuba didn't change at all. Only when Castro passed away and the regime began to change somewhat. Uh, and North Korea, it's heavily sanctioned. It can hardly do anything, and yet we haven't seen any change in you know, the regime over there or its crazed uh, program of building uh, nuclear capability and ballistic missiles. Uh, so uh, we have to use other aspects of sanctions. And uh, one of the things we have to understand, too, is that uh, sanctions work best when there are many states cooperating. Uh, multilateral. Our Cuba sanctions, of course, didn't work because we were the only ones sanctioning Cuba, and they had this big friend in Russia, and they could easily supply uh, what was needed. Uh, and we have focused a lot on uh, UN sanctions uh, because that's the source of international authority and law, uh, and it also is the mechanism that allows many states to cooperate in imposing sanctions. As I'll mention in a moment, we cooperate a lot with the European Union on the sanctions against Russia. Uh, but the states of the European Union are, have very strict laws about when they can impose measures against other states. And the authority of the United Nations Security Council is very important for them. It sort of allows them to then uh, move in their domestic policies towards uh, imposing sanctions. So multilateral sanctions, in principle, are always better than unilateral. Uh, and this is an important part of our sanctions policy. It also uh, matters whether the, the state imposing the sanctions has extensive trade relations with the targeted regime. Uh, and it's one of the ironies of, or, or maybe a paradox of sanctions, is that they're most effective against your friends where you have a lot of extensive trading relations. Uh, so with the sanctions against Russia, the US is in a, a difficult position because our trade with Russia was never that great to begin with, and it's been going down over the years. Uh, whereas the European Union, they have extensive trade relations with Russia, uh, more than 10 times as much as the United States. Uh, and that means that they are a crucial partner in working in the policy of uh, imposing sanctions against Russia. Uh, and then I guess the, the, the main finding is that sanctions are only a tool in the policy toolkit. Uh, they're just one among many other instruments that can be applied in any particular crisis. They are not the policy. They are part of the overall policy. And too often we see, uh, as I say, political leaders in Washington, all they can think about is sanctions uh, and don't look at the other aspects of our international policy. We're seeing that in, in Ukraine now, where there is this intensive war underway and where we're providing military support for Ukraine, uh, but then also applying sanctions against Russia. Uh, so that we're, we're, I think, learning and applying the sanctions well in this case, and we'll go through that more in a moment. Um, so it's, it's just part of a broader policy. The thing, though, I think uh, that has been not given enough attention in our policy towards Russia so far is the diplomatic aspect, the use of sanctions to encourage uh, bargaining, sanctions as leverage. And I'll say more about that as we go along here. Sanctions are uh, a troubled instrument and troubling in some respects. Um, they cause uh, many negative effects. There are uh, sometimes uh, negative humanitarian consequences and political consequences. Uh, 
when sanctions were first, in, first imposed, you saw that Putin was able to blame all of the economic problems of Russia on us and the European Union. And it really kind of helped rally the flag. Uh, and there were some opinion, opinion polls showing that you know, his approval ratings went up after the sanctions were imposed. And this is a pattern you do see from time to time, that uh, they allow the targeted leaders to put a lot of the blame and make excuses by uh, putting the attention on the external pressures. Uh, the humanitarian issues are serious in many cases. Uh, and this is one of the greatest challenges to sanctions. When Professor Lopez and I began on this, uh, our concern was with the humanitarian impact of the sanctions that were imposed against Iraq in the 1990s. It was a comprehensive trade embargo, cut off all of their revenues from their oil exports, uh, and the result was a, a real humanitarian disaster. Uh, thankfully, we've learned, and there was a shift in policymaking away from general trade embargoes towards more targeted measures, uh, financial travel uh, sanctions and, and then arms embargoes. Uh, but there are still uh, negative humanitarian impacts that sometimes result from sanctions. And this is an issue now with our sanctions against Iran and Venezuela and perhaps Syria as well. And State Department and US policymakers are aware of this and they are trying to make adapt. Uh, adapt the policy to address those concerns. Uh, of course, sanctions also uh, create an incentive for evasion and criminality. And in every case, you see where the sanction regime will find ways to uh, get intermediaries, cutouts, so they can uh, avoid the pressures that uh, come in with sanctions. Uh, so it's a, a, a policy that has both the positive and the negative effects. Um, and there's too much of a focus on the imposition of sanctions with relatively little uh, focus on the uh, monitoring and the implementation and the tracking of how well they're being uh, actually applied. Uh, and this is one of the areas where I think the Russia sanctions need more attention, as I'll say here in a moment. So when and how do sanctions work? Uh, this is a table from the book by Tom Bierstecker and his team in the Targeted Sanctions Consortium based on 60 some cases of multilateral sanctions. Uh, and looking at three particular purposes, uh, the signaling to uphold international norms. For that, sanctions are very effective. Nations impose sanctions because they disagree with uh, Russia's act of aggression. aggression. Aggression and military attack against another sovereign state is illegal under international law, uh, and something must be done to express that objection from the international community, so sanctions are very appropriate. Um, but sanctions can also help to uh, constrain, uh, can be uh, an instrument of containment and limit the ability of a violating state to carry on its policies. Uh, and in that instance, they tend to be uh, more effective. Uh, of course, most political leaders, when they impose sanctions, they're hoping they can coerce the adversary to change policy. Uh, but that's the area where it's least likely to be effective on its own. Uh, so it's thinking about what sanctions can and cannot do that is really an important part of the overall framework. Now let's focus on, on the Russia sanctions and the savage war that Russia is waging against Ukraine. Uh, and I'm a scholar of peace studies and have been advocating for peace and have been opposed to many wars. But sometimes wars are just uh, if it's a defensive war. And even under international law, wars are prohibited except for when a nation has been attacked by another nation. Uh, and so clearly, uh, this is what we face, what we see in Ukraine. Uh, and it's right, I think, for the United States to support Ukraine in its war of self-defense against Russia, as we are, do we are doing. Uh, but it's been a difficult struggle. And uh, there's a fear that it may be uh, at a stalemate. Uh, the two sides are batting, battling fiercely. And we'll see. Obviously, it's up to the two parties, Russia and Ukraine, to decide when it's appropriate to try to negotiate. Uh, 
I'll talk about diplomacy, but with the understanding that it's the decision that comes from the parties. It's not a decision that either party is willing to consider right now, but I'll make the case. I hope that uh, it's necessary to think ahead and plan and be ready for the negotiating process when it comes. But for now, we do have a, a two-pronged policy, the military support and financial support for Ukraine to fight, and the US and the EU are working together on this policy very effectively and providing massive amounts of uh, material and financial support, uh, and then the sanctions. Uh, and these are very comprehensive sanctions, and they are just in, in the sense of, of the worldwide condemnation of uh, Putin's war includes uh, strong support for cutting off Russia from the world economy to the extent that we can. Right? And there are very extensive sanctions. Uh, 11,000 uh, individuals and entities have been targeted with these sanctions. Uh, it includes most of the major banks in Russia, uh, many of the top political leaders, the oligarchs, uh, a wide range of uh, companies uh, have been sanctioned. Uh, and many countries are participating in, this, uh, in these efforts. Here we can see the states that are participating and the kinds of measures that are being imposed. So about 30 some countries are joining the US uh, and working through the, union, the European Union, uh, representing about half of the global GDP. Uh, so while it's not the majority of the world's nations, it is close to the majority of the world's economic power, if you will. And if you come to financial power, you know, the hard currency states are all on board with the uh, sanctions. So it's a mighty coalition and is imposing uh, extensive measures, uh, the financial sanctions uh, against the banks. We've also cut off uh, Russia's access to the SWIFT international banking communication system so they're not able to make international banking transactions. Uh, we've frozen uh, their sovereign wealth fund. Uh, they have two parts of the fund. One is in Russia, but the other is internationally, mostly in banks in Europe and in Japan, $300 billion, which they do not have access to. And there's a lot of debate about what to do with that money. It's certainly not gonna go back to Russia anytime soon, uh, but well, how it can be leveraged uh, once the war uh, finally comes to an end. So this, these financial measures are really huge. Of course, there's also the sanctions against uh, energy exports, uh, oil and gas. I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, and very importantly, uh, export controls, attempting to prevent the export to Russia of advanced uh, Microsoft, uh, I mean, you know, microconductor, uh, sorry, uh, so semiconductor, <laughs> and uh, integrated circuit uh, equipment that they can use for their military operations. Uh, and that's uh, all a critically uh, de designed strategic attempt to cut off their ability and restrain their ability to conduct the war. Uh, so how, how well are we doing in this goal? Several things here. So one of the unique aspects of the sanctions is the exit of the private sector. Uh, and this is not something that was intended or developed by governments, but more than a thousand companies have left Russia. So there's no more, no more Big Macs. This is the, remember when they opened the McDonald's in, down near Pushkin Square in, in Moscow? Uh, that's all gone, and, and many, many other com companies have left. The estimates are it represents maybe a third of their GDP. Uh, with all these foreign companies gone, includes some auto manufacturers, others, uh, aviation equipment support. Um, and the, with also about 12% of their labor force uh, was employed in these companies. So this is unprecedented and a very powerful part of the economic leverage against Russia. And not only that, but you have the flight of uh, talent and of young people and of uh, men generally away from Russia, partly to escape the draft, but also some of the employees who worked with these companies. So the estimates are about 700,000 uh, have fled Russia, IT workers. They're the most talented, the most Western-oriented uh, part of their workforce has gone. And 
they're now working out of you know, computer centers in Yerevan and you know, various cities in the Central Asian states or uh, in Europe or in Georgia. Uh, and some of them are still trying to continue their work, but most of them have left. And you know, they want to go back, most of them, but it's uh, very difficult and they're not going back anytime soon. So this is a, a, a unique aspect that's really been important. It's basically draining the economic productivity and the innovative talent from the Russian economy. The oil and gas sanctions have been imposed. As we know, it's been controversial. Initially, as you can see from this graph of the revenues of oil and gas for Russia, uh, because of the sanctions, the price of oil and gas went up, uh, and Putin got more money. There was like a huge financial bonanza. Uh, but uh, several things happened that have contributed now to what appears to be more success for the energy sanctions. Uh, one is that Europe amazingly adapted to cut off and uh, no longer be dependent on Russian gas. Uh, and Germany in particular, but uh, most of the states of Europe uh, were able to get through this winter. Luckily, it was a fairly mild winter. Uh, they got the liquid natural, natural gas uh, exports in, and uh, they've been able to adapt. And Remember that Putin cut off gas exports to Europe, thinking that this was punishment. And it's ended up backfiring, because now uh, Europe is it's getting only about 7% of its gas from Russian supplies. Uh, and basically, in future, they're not going to be buying Russian gas. Uh, so this is very significant and uh, will have a long-term effect in depressing the revenues for uh, the Kremlin. The other thing that's happened is with the price cap. Very interesting. Again, this is new. Uh, initially, there was an you know, attempt to cut off the oil exports entirely uh, because this would have such broad global effects, and it did for a while. We've all been paying more for gas lately. Uh, so they came up with the idea of the price cap. So oil sales are permitted, but now the cap is at $60 a, a barrel. Uh, and the, this has had the effect of uh, continuing sales, but diminishing the amount of revenue that comes into the Kremlin. Uh, and uh, the indications, as I say, are that it's starting to work. Uh, so this is uh, one of those areas where, I, when I gave this talk a few months ago, I'd say, well, it looks like the energy sanctions aren't really working. But now maybe there's uh, more effect. And this is one of those measures where the long-term effect impact will be uh, significant. Uh, the financial sanctions uh, are starting to have effects as well. Uh, here we can see the budget deficit for uh, the Russian state. Uh, they were able to uh, balance out their national economy by drawing from their reserve funds over the last year, uh, but that's not able to be sustained over the long term. Uh, and with now with the energy revenues declining, and as you'll see in a moment, the imports uh, have declined, uh, and their exports have been declining. So uh, overall, they're facing more uh, uncertainty in their national budget. The ruble took a real beating initially when the sanctions were imposed. Then the Russian government stepped in and instituted capital controls. Uh, and various other measures to stabilize the euro. Uh, and so during the summer, it looked like it was actually in, in better shape than it had been over the last couple of years. But now starting to trend back down again. Uh, and this one is it's unpredictable in many respects, but uh, trending down is, is a good sign. And uh, uh, here we see the effects on Russia of the overall export controls and of the sanctions in terms of the economic uh, production declining uh, over the last few quarters. And uh, here again, this is potentially very significant. Uh, Russia's automobile industry is basically tanked, uh, partly because some of the Western companies pulled out. Uh, their aviation industry is 
uh, barely functional. They buy most of their planes from Boeing or the Airbus, uh, but all the servicing companies uh, have now been cut back as well. And they've had to cannibalize planes to be able to keep flying. Uh, and they've had their safety record was bad to begin with, and it's gotten worse. Um, so, uh, and this will potentially and seems to be able to affect their military production as well. I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, here you see the uh, trends in exports and imports uh, for Russia. Uh, and those imports are important because that's the uh, industrial goods, the high technology goods that Russia has had to depend on uh, for its military sector. Uh, and that was going down uh, for a while. But as you can see, the line is starting to go back up again over the last quarter of last year and the first quarter of this year. Uh, and this is where the export controls to keep the semiconductor products and other advanced technologies out of Russia's hands uh, to degrade their military capabilities uh, has been not working as well as was intended. So a number of investigators have looked into this. And uh, what we're seeing is that the, uh, these imports of the semiconductor products are, are rising. Uh, it's very worrisome. And they've tracked it down to uh, this pattern. It's kind of a difficult chart to see. But basically what it's telling us is that uh, countries that had been previously exporting technology goods to Russia uh, stopped for a while. So the number, the trends went down. And now they're shipping them to these central, um, these so-called independent states, Commonwealth of Independent States, the Central Asian states, uh, and to Turkey and to other friendly states to Russia. And then they're going forward into Russia. And the New York Times had this dramatic photo a couple of months ago of the trucks pouring into Russia from Georgia. Uh, and this isn't trade just from Georgia. This is stuff coming from Europe or from China uh, that then comes up to the border. Uh, so uh, we've identified these leaks, and there's efforts underway to try to uh, tighten up and in improve the enforcement of these sanctions. So let me conclude this part with some of the recommendations that have been brought forward by uh, a number of the research groups uh, of ways to uh, improve the effectiveness of the sanctions. My view is that uh, they're having some impacts, uh, and they are helping to degrade, to some extent, Russia's ability to wage war. I mean, the fact that they've had to buy weapons from Iran and North Korea is a sign. Uh, there are reports of them cannibalizing appliances and other uh, goods in order to get the semiconductor products and the circuits out so they can try to apply them to their military goods. Um, so, and they're using a lot of mothballed equipment. Uh, so their ability to sustain a massive war operation like this uh, it's being strained. Whether they can sustain it for how long, we don't know. But, but that's what we want to do is try to constrain that ability, as I went back to my earlier chart. Um, so things can be done. Uh, there is no international agency really focusing on this. The US and the European Union both have a lot of people working on this, carefully trying to monitor these measures. But it's not coordinated well enough. Uh, we spend huge amounts of money uh, supplying military goods. Our military budget is rising more and more. Uh, my view would be we ought to be spending or maybe taking some of that money and spending it on a, a, a system of more effectively trying to track and, and then find ways of improving the enforcement of these economic measures. Uh, and especially with the uh, states that have been violating the sanctions by going to the Central Asian republics and then uh, being a, turning a blind eye to the fact that they're going on into Russia. Uh, there should be measures taken. I saw that Secretary of State Blinken went out to Kazakhstan and several states recently and talked with the officials there. That's important. Uh, but I think we could think about trying to develop actual sanctions uh, stations for monitoring and a more vigorous in, uh, enforcement of the measures. 
back in the 90s when Professor Lopez and I were studying the Yugoslavia sanctions, uh, the, there was established a so-called sanctions assistance mission in which the European states and the US went to the surrounding states and helped them establish much more rigorous border monitoring. Uh, and this is something where we could go to these states like Kazakhstan and others and help them to acquire the most advanced uh, monitoring equipment uh, and maybe provide some of the technology and some of the financing uh, to ensure that these measures are uh, effectively implemented. And there are talks about um, lowering the price cap uh, on the oil. There's several uh, leading experts are talking about lowering it down to 40. Uh, and you know we'll see. Uh, the lower it gets, the more incentives there will be for people to evade. Uh, but one of the tricks for the, the, the price cap that's working is that uh, ships um, need uh, insurance. And most of the insurance comes from Western companies. Um, and they'll not insure under these conditions. So um, it's all kind of working together in this uh, attempt to really try to uh, put the squeeze on Russia, continue to try to degrade its military capacity uh, in support of Ukraine's war of self-defense. The one thing that, I, as I said earlier on, is the lack of uh, focus on negotiation. And here I think that more can and should be done to uh, prepare for negotiations um, and to think about how sanctions can be used as as leverage. Uh, when we look at where sanctions have succeeded in other places, the offer of sanctions relief often turns out to be a valuable and effective incentive to get the other party to negotiate. Uh, on the Iran deal, uh, if you look at how that came about, it was the willingness of the US and the European states to offer to the Iranians, if you put on these limits on your nuclear program and allow strict inspection, we're willing to lift the sanctions. So something like this, I think, needs to be considered in uh, this case of Russia and the war in Ukraine. Uh, the New York Times editorialized about this a couple of times over the last year. Uh, and part of this is a communications strategy. Uh, Putin can't sustain this work, for, well, we hope, uh, for the period that he feels he may want to. Uh, and we need to figure out a way to communicate to the government, but also to the Russian people, that you, know, you can get your money back. You know, companies will return. Uh, we can go back to business as usual if you will withdraw your troops and end this terrible war. Uh, right now, of course, they're not willing. But it's important to prepare for that process, to think about what the planning would be. And one of the key elements that we've learned in peace research about other peace agreements is the necessity of having international participation in the process. If it's just Ukraine and Russia sitting at the table by themselves, the chances of reaching an agreement will be less. And then the chances of actually implementing whatever they negotiate will be even less. In all these successful peace agreements that we've been investigating, you have international support, international sponsorship of the negotiations. Uh, you have third party monitoring, uh, and you have uh, conflict resolution mechanisms, dispute resolution mechanisms that are established with third party participation. All of that's a task for the international community. And I believe we should be preparing now to think about what that's going to look like. If there's a ceasefire, which there needs to be to start the process, uh, how is it going to be monitored? You need to have a very substantial and robust force. Uh, if Russia starts to withdraw its troops, which is a bottom line demand for ending this war, how does that get monitored? If there's a political process for people in Crimea and the Eastern Donbass to decide which way they want to go politically, how does that get done? They had one before in the Minsk process. It was all fake and uh, doesn't really work without international observers, international administration. Uh, so there's a lot of ways in which the international community can play a role. And for that, we need to cooperate with as many states as possible, including the states that have been friends of Russia in this, Turkey, China, 
India, if not now, friends, they're not supportive of the war, but they're not opposed to it either. When the UN had its vote in the General Assembly, 32 states abstained. Uh, and in that group were these states that I mentioned. They can play a role because Russia trusts them more than they would any of the European states or the US. Uh, and we need to think about what that structure might look like. And for this, I think we need to talk to China, we need to figure out how we could work together. Uh, Russia, uh, China has you know, said it has a 10 point plan for peace, um, 12 point plan I think it is. Uh, you know, I've studied it, it's nothing. It's uh, really lightweight, no, no specifics. But you know, they want to talk about peace. Uh, it's interesting that when he met with Putin this past week, uh, they did not offer any military help. They kept talking about wanting to negotiate uh, and enter the war. Uh, so let's talk to them and see whether they could play a role, and Turkey and some of the other states. Uh, and in, I've been studying very carefully the Columbia Peace Agreement, because the Kroc Institute is kind of an official monitor of that process. And that agreement was under the auspices of Cuba and Norway, and the two states were the guarantors. And then there are like a dozen states in Colombia working with the rebel groups and the government to assist in the implementation of the process. And in the Northern Ireland Accord, the United States was a major player providing support and encouragement for the process. So in this case, let's start lining up the, the list of international partners who can be uh, allies in figuring out a way to negotiate an end to this war. So sanctions can play a role. Uh, the offer of easing the sanctions, of returning their $300 billion in hard currency assets, uh, various other measures that can be taken to begin to ease up all these pressures in exchange for Russia ending the wars, stopping the bombing, ceasefire, and the withdrawal of the troops. So let me uh, finish there. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. <laughs>Yeah, the sanctions in South Africa were never really very comprehensive. Uh, in fact, the U.S. didn't impose sanctions until um, like well along in the process, 86, 87. The U.N. had an arms embargo, uh, and there were some other measures. But in South Africa, there were a, a couple of aspects that were significant, and they have to do with the role of like private, private sector and civil society. Uh, the governments didn't impose this, but you started to see sports associations and music uh, uh, concert groups uh, refusing to perform. Uh, and increasingly, uh, the apartheid regime, the government of South Africa, found itself isolated internationally, culturally, um, but also economically. The, the sanctions did start to have an effect. Uh, and we looked at this in one of the chapters, uh, in one of our books. Uh, and the, the decisive moment that came was when their financing from the international banking institutions in New York and London, uh, they started to find higher rates. The rollover was short term rather than long term. Uh, and increasingly, they were unable to sustain their financing. Uh, and of course, this was also in the face of this massive civil resistance by the African, uh, African National Congress. Uh, all through that period in the 80s, there was a m massive non-cooperation in the townships and all the rest. Uh, and it was quite violent in terms of how the apartheid government suppressed it. Uh, so you had this massive non-cooperation within the population. And then uh, a lot of international pressure on the regime to negotiate. Uh, and 
the combination of that pressure really intensified. And I think when the banks rolled them over short term, that was sort of a, a signal that the game couldn't be sustained any longer. And that's when they contacted Mandela and said, will you talk? And uh, the negotiations began. Um, so I'd say, yes, yeah, sanctions were part of the process. Uh, the other unique thing about the South Africa case is the people in the ANC, the African uh, resistors, said, we want sanctions. You know, in a lot of cases, people say, well, sanctions only hurt us as civilians. Uh, but in South Africa, they said, better sanctions than apartheid. Uh, and if it helps us, uh, we want it. And the ANC had international representatives who were, who were at the UN. They were accredited at the UN. And, uh, and they encouraged states to impose sanctions. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, as I pointed out, I think the sanctions relief was a decisive factor. Uh, well, two things really helped to uh, achieve the deal. One was that the U.S. Uh, conceded to the Iranians that they had the right to have an enrichment program, uranium enrichment, that the International Non-Proliferation Treaty does not ban enrichment. Quite the contrary, it encourages states to develop their civilian nuclear industries. And there are a couple dozen other countries that have enrichment. Enrichment program. Uh, so we basically conceded to reality. But then the sanctions were pretty stiff, very uh, strict financial sanctions, similar to what we've imposed in Russia. Uh, but there was the offer to lift the measures. Uh, but then we did have the demand signal or the, the internal process, too, that uh, the re more reformist or pragmatist uh, government of Rouhani was elected. And uh, that wasn't something we predicted or knew or even was going to be happening. Uh, so you had that window where you had a, a regime that was interested. And, and Rouhani, when he was campaigning, he said, uh, well, we want to uh, move the economy ahead and get out of our international isolation. Well, the only way they could do that was to cop a deal on the nuclear program. So several things came together to make that possible. And you know, I think credit the Obama administration. They really were committed to the diplomacy and Secretary Kerry uh, and the Europeans. So together it worked uh, quite well. You know, in Russia we don't have that domestic signal at all. Uh, and Putin is so isolated, the system is so authoritarian and autocratic that it's hard to figure where we would find some part of the Russian constellation that would be open to starting to work with the Europeans and with other states. Uh, so that's it's this may may go on for a while, sadly, because of that. I think. Um, I hope I'm wrong on that. <laughs> yeah, there are a number of cases. I think one that isn't remembered as much as Libya, uh, from the 1980s. Uh, Libya was a uh, notorious state sponsor of terrorism in those days. And of course, the, the Pan Am uh, uh, 107, was it, plane that went? Lockerbie. Lockerbie, sorry, yeah, plane that went down and over Lockerbie. And also the French plane that was uh, bombed and hundreds of people were killed. Uh, the UN then imposed uh, targeted sanctions. And it wasn't a general embargo, it was sanctions against their military sector, but also their aviation. So it was intended to go after the area where they had been uh, engaging in their criminal acts. Um, so those sanctions were imposed, uh, along with some financial sanctions on specific uh, political leaders. Uh, and over the course of the 80s, uh, Gaddafi's regime felt that pressure. And it did begin to have an impact internally, and uh, they basically changed their policy. The State Department's annual reports on international terrorism 
I think it was 1985 report, said that uh, Libya has, uh, is no longer a state sponsor of terrorism as a result of the sanctions. And then there was a, a negotiation process where actually Nelson Mandela and some of the African states um, became, they put pressure on the US and the other states to say the sanctions have been on too long, you need to negotiate. And then they went to Gaddafi and said, you need to negotiate. Uh, anyway, the result was that Gaddafi did get out of the business of state sponsorship of terrorism. Um, and most of the sanctions were lifted. The US kept on some of its sanctions, however, and continued the negotiation because we were also worried about their weapons program, uh, and weapons of mass destruction that they were starting to develop in those days. Uh, and actually, if you look at the record there, uh, Ambassador Ted McNamara was the person who was the chief State Department person involved here. He wrote a chapter for one of our books. And uh, increasingly, Gaddafi and his son saw that their future depended on in, being integrated into the European and global economy. Uh, they were too isolated. Uh, and they gave up state sponsorship of terror, and they gave up the WMD programs. And then they were caught <laughs> shipping weapons illegally uh, in 03. Uh, so overall, I mean, it's kind of strange to think of Libya as a success story. Uh, but in terms of what we were trying to get internationally, stop state terrorism, stop their weapons program, they were relatively successful. Yeah. yeah. They uh, strongly encourage the perpetrator of the conflict uh, to comply with the terms they give them an option to say the peace. Mm -hmm. uh, so they give them an option. So the question is, for coercion purposes, uh, to what extent is it possible to allow the Russian government to say that they <coughs> to say that they would rather without taking any intervention from the U.S. or the U.S. Yeah, that's that is the question <laughs> that we're all facing now, and. Uh, I don't have the answer. It's ultimately going to be made, you know, partly on the battlefield and by what Ukrainian authorities and the Russians will do. But I think as I look at what a formula might come to, uh, you go back to the Minsk process in 2015. And in that process, uh, Russia did agree to a <coughs> local, a local determination of autonomy or not, you know, in eastern uh, Donbass area. Uh, and for um, an election process in Crimea. Uh, and they did agree that they would withdraw their troops uh, and that the borders would be under Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, but neither side implemented it. The Ukrainians also didn't really want to have uh, a political process to allow people to choose whether they wanted to go with Russia or not. And as you know, there are a lot of Russian speaking, Russian speaking kind of pro-Russian or communities in the eastern Donbass and in Crimea. Uh, and a political process would be a way to try to resolve the crisis without further bloodshed. And we see this in other peace processes where regions that are in dispute are given an opportunity to have a political process, uh, election or whatever, uh, to determine their fate. Uh, and it can work. So I think for Putin, I mean, he has to face the fact that he's been, this is one of the huge blunders of Russian history, uh, and he's already lost. Uh, and the question is, how much more can he lose and hold on to power? Uh, and this idea of having to be able to say, well, at least we have uh, the opportunity for some of these populations to choose which way they want to go. Uh, and if it's internationally supervised, you know, I don't think we should object to that. Uh, I mean, there are profound moral dilemmas here. You know, it's somewhat rewarding aggression. Uh, that's true. Uh, but that weighed against the costs of just more and more war, especially if we are reaching into a stalemate situation, uh, and that continues for a couple more years, uh, what's the point? Uh, so that might be, uh, when I think about what Putin could possibly salvage out of this, 
No, not much. Um, and perhaps, you know, with the, again, the sanctions relief, you know, the idea that uh, Russia would need to somehow get reintegrated in the world economy, uh, and that's in their self interest. Uh, and is that enough of an inducement for them to think about that? And I also think, I mean, this is more for our side. I think you know, I was never in favor of NATO expansion. I think it was a big mistake to push it the way they did. And it doesn't in any way justify what Putin has done. Uh, but uh, going forward, we, we want to be able to work with Russia. And this is a neuralgic issue for a lot of Russians. Can we work out some relationship with Russia between NATO and Russia? Well, way back there was the Russia-NATO Council in, early, in the 90s when they started the, the uh, NATO expansion. Uh, you know, could we, do, we need some arrangement so that Russia feels that it's part of European security, it has its own paranoias. And Ukraine will need significant security guarantees because you know, they rightly fear that as soon as Russia, you know, it may end now, but then they'll come back again. And uh, so there's a lot of really complicated security issues that will have to be addressed here. And that's another reason why it has to be an international process. The European states, the US, NATO have to be part of this. And, and China could play a role there, a balancing role. Um, so, you know, and there were a lot of negotiations right before the war, you know, in the, the uh, so-called Normandy front and the, uh, the Germans and the French and other states and the U.S. were negotiating. Uh, the sides were far apart and obviously could not get anywhere before the war started. But now it'll, it'll have to go back to some of those issues. And arms control will be part of it, you know, the nuclear issues as well as the conventional weapons issues. So. That security relationship between Russia and Europe and the US uh, has to be part of the equation. It's not going to be the front end of the negotiations, but it has to be somehow in the process. That, and that's where Putin or whoever is successful will be, have to say, well, we got something out of this. We got uh, our security in Europe is better now, perhaps, they might think. I don't know. David, does the um, indictment of Putin by the International Criminal Court complicate all this negotiation. I mean, they're eager to have the negotiations happen as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I think we all would. Yeah. Does that throw a wrench in all that, or why so? Well, it's a, it puts a price. Uh, it may, it's, a, it's something else that adds to the price that Putin is paying. I mean, he does have to fear if he were to show up in certain countries, he would get arrested. And uh, so, I doubt he's going to be making many trips beyond <laughs> to Western Europe for sure, or over in North America. Um, so, you know, that's always an issue with the ICC that you uh, indict officials who you need to have be part of a negotiation. Uh, same thing with sanctions. You know, when they, we had the failed attempt, attempt to negotiate with the Taliban, and before we could negotiate with them, we had to remove some of their officials from the sanctions li list. Um, so, uh, in the case of the criminal court indictment, uh, maybe there's some way to suspend it if there's a negotiation. I don't know yeah. of the legal procedures, but um, but there does need to be a criminal proceeding, absolutely. And I think Putin's guilty not only of authorizing these crimes that his forces committed, but aggression is the supreme crime of war. You remember the judgment from the Nuremberg Tribunal. Uh, it is the supreme crime crime of war in that it contains within it all the evil of the rest of war. And it is strictly forbidden by the UN Charter. Uh, so, but yeah, I think uh, a criminal proceeding will be necessary. Um, but you know, in other places, the reconciliation process after war uh, includes truth processes. And in Colombia, the this tremendous truth commission. In South Africa, there was the, the truth commission, uh, truth and reconciliation commission. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that now in the midst of this terrible war, but um, we need to give attention to that. What role can the victims play? Those who have themselves been directly uh, violated by this war, we need to hear them and they need to have a, a voice. And so as we think about a negotiation, a peace process, uh, somewhere that needs to be part of the equation.
Well, going back to one of your maps, I showed Russia, the country participating in the sanctions, and those who weren't. Is there anything else you can tell us about the countries that weren't? Because your map showed all of Latin America, yeah. mm -hmm. South America, all of Africa, almost all of Asia, not participating. And it looked like North America, the EU, and some of their allies were, or it was mm -hmm. almost what we might call rich and poor, mm -hmm. uh, Western and non Western. Why, is there anything else to tell us about those countries who are not supporting the sanctions? Yeah. Well, I think many of them, their level of trade and involvement in uh, the Russian economy is, is very minimal. Uh, but others like India, which is getting a lot of its uh, energy resources from Russia and has traditionally gotten a lot of its weapons from Russia, uh, is unwilling to turn on its you know, important ally. Uh, in Africa, uh, traditionally Russia during the Cold War supported a number of the revolutionary movements. Uh, and there was a sense by some of those governments that was the successor of the rebellions that uh, Russia was really their ally and their friend. Uh, and I think there's some of that legacy continues in, in a number of the African states. Um, and there's also, I think, a way in which a lot of these states, while they trade with the US, they work with us on a lot of things, they also resent you know, our hegemonic military policies. Uh, Remember in the Iraq war, we were extremely unpopular and many of these states would say, well, you know, the US committed aggression too. And, uh, and a lot of people died needlessly because of it. Uh, so uh, you know, I think the, the developing world, if you will, uh, they're not comfortable with choosing sides in these kinds of conflicts. Um, and so that's part of it. Uh, you know, what else we can argue? Uh, some of the states like Turkey and China, they have strategic interests here. You know, uh, they want to play diplomatically and have a voice in this because it's in their interest to do so. Uh, and China especially, you know, it seems to me like they're going to buy up Russia like they do a lot of other countries almost, it seems, uh, because Russia is more and more dependent on them. Uh, Turkey obviously wants to position itself as a major uh, broker in that area. Uh, so remaining distant from the US-European war is important for that. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of calculations. I can't say uh, in many of these states what the motivation is. Uh, although it's important to look, if you, if you go to the uh, UN General Assembly votes, which I think are a better indicator, indicator of the view towards this war. Uh, three times the General Assembly has voted and it's pretty much been the same, 141 against, about seven or eight with Russia against, uh, you know, opposing the resolution. And then about 30 some states that abstain. Uh, and those are the ones that I think make a strategic calculation, the abstainers. But a lot of the African states or the Latin American states do vote to condemn the aggression. Or in the most recent resolution a couple weeks ago, to demand that Russia immediately with, remove its troops. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a mix. And then the last thing I'll say is a lot of these developing states uh, are instinctively opposed to sanctions. Many of them have been on the receiving end of sanctions of one sort or another, often from the US. So, uh, and of the European states, you know, it's a post colonial um, perspective that many of these states have. Um, and they don't want to be subservient to the Europeans or the Americans. Um, so I think those are some of the motivations, but I haven't really investigated that very deeply. But. This is a question about the effectiveness of specific sanctions, either uh, the Rush, sanction against the Russian oil and gas industry, because that just includes the national equipment, mm -hmm. or sanctions on the luxury goods, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the goal is to seize the assets of the oligarchs, those who are close to Putin in the decision-making apparatus there. Uh, and have they been effective? It's unclear. You know, maybe there's a few yachts that are impounded here and there. Uh, I think the bank accounts are it's probably more significant. Uh, and uh, but again, those monies they they were not in the Kremlin's treasury anyway. Uh, and I think part of the hope was that if you uh, cause some hardships for a lot of the cronies of the Kremlin, maybe some of them would begin to plot against Putin or try to change the policy. But it's it's so rigidly autocratic and controlled from the top that I don't think that's a, you know it was a s- smart calculation. It was just not doesn't seem to be possible. Uh, more important is the overall oil and gas uh, measures, and uh, to the extent that they can uh, continue to cause hardships or, or, or deficits in their budget and weakening in the ruble, uh, this would be a, like really important indicators to follow here in the coming months. Uh, and uh, but I think the way in which Europe has adapted to basically go cold turkey on, on the gas from Russia is very significant. The other inter- interesting thing in Europe is the way in which it's, it's accelerated their green deal, their, their green economy initiatives. Uh, and we ought to be doing that here as well. And, and globally, hopefully that could be uh, one result that might come of this. Uh, we don't need to be dependent on his oil and gas. and uh, So it forces us to move more quickly toward the goal that we need to address global climate change. Um, having studied many of these cases, are there some that perhaps should be looked at? <laughs> what would you suggest? Well, I think I think many of them, and you know, we put them on for often. The pressure comes from the Congress, uh, and the administration has to impose these measures. Uh, and after a while, well, first of all, they don't really have much real impact. Uh, in changing the policy on the coercive side of the purposes. Uh, and they may become dysfunctional in trying to develop and meet other purposes. You know, so Venezuela is a very interesting case right now. So we have a lot of sanctions on Venezuela. Uh, but uh, we lately have needed other sources of oil. And there's a whole lot there. And uh, also in Colombia now you have a, m- a more left-wing government which is working well with Venezuela. Uh, and they're actually in the midst of these negotiations for one of the other rebel groups to kind of continue the peace process. Uh, so we thought of Venezuela as a, a bad citizen, but now they're doing some things that are in our interest. So shouldn't we think about, is this the right time to you know, start lifting or at least suspend measures for a while? Um, and, there, and there's a lot of. Uh, leverage in the uh, sanctions easing business. There's a couple of colleagues who are kind of writing their dissertations just on this concept of how you ease sanctions. And and when there's so many thousands and thousands of sanctions in place, you've got a lot to work with. But you could uh, delist certain individuals, uh, or you could suspend certain measures for six months or a year and make it conditional on some reciprocity and some cooperation from the other side. Um, so I think, in general, we ought to be reviewing all of these measures uh, and starting to pull back. And we have, I think, there's 300 or more uh, individuals and entities in China that are now sanctioned over human rights issues and against the Uyghurs and other legitimate issues, absolutely. Uh, but are sanctions the right tool uh, for doing this? Uh, and if we do need to figure out a way to work with China, even if we disagree with their system and we compete with them in many ways, uh, but we shouldn't be confronting them and we don't need to be involved in any kind of military threats. And and the sanctions, uh, I would suspect, are right now, and uh, they are definitely an irritant in China. They're not really going to affect them. They're so huge in terms of their overall strategic interests. But 
why do we have them on in, when they're not effective and they just irritate the other guy that we want to work with? Um, so I think some, that's an area where some easing, some partial lifting uh, could go a long way in signaling to Xi and the government in China that we still disagree with you on all these things, but we can work together. We're realists in geopolitics, and sometimes we need to work together. Well, of course, they're low cost. You know, it doesn't, uh, you don't have to send the Marines, uh, risk the lives of men and women, women in uniform. Uh, and, you know, there's a certain appeal. You know, members can get up in Congress and say, we're going to go after these Chinese people who are oppressing the Uyghur population. Um, and it's good for the folks back home <laughs> as a defender of human rights. Uh, it's a lot of symbolism. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's policy on the cheap in a way. But actually, if you, if you do it extensively, as we are doing now with Russia, or as Europeans are doing, uh, it's pretty costly. You have to make sacrifices. You have to be willing to, as the Europeans did, get completely shift away from gas in a few months, six to nine months. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's also a, a policy that's not very well understood, and, and it just gets done without a lot of uh, careful thought. Um, so it's policy making on the cheap, if you will. Okay, I think we have one this last question. Betty? This relates more to you suggested learning diplomacy. Hmm. And in connection with that, one of the things that has so struck me is the that has happened to the whole infrastructure in Ukraine. Is there any way that sanctions can help with that or what can help with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a number of proposals that have been made. So I mentioned this 300 billion that's sitting in the banks in Europe and Japan, uh, that th those funds should be seized and used to help with the rebuilding of Ukraine. Uh, it's interesting, the, the World Bank just produced a report uh, this week uh, estimating that the cost of reconstruction uh, as of now would be about $400 billion. Uh, it's a colossal sum, but it happens to be relatively close to this, this amount. Um, there are a lot of legal problems with doing that, uh, and you know, especially the European banks, I think, are going to be reluctant. Uh, but I think there's a couple of court cases now that are starting to move in uh, to test it in terms of the um, international legal procedures. Uh, but yeah, I think Russia has an obligation, a moral obligation, a uh, political obligation to pay for the destruction that they've caused. Uh, realistically, uh, how that gets done, I don't know. I suspect that we'll likely see a lot of states joining in. The World Bank will probably play a role in this. Um, but some of these seized financial assets could logically be used to help with this important part of what's going to be necessary to recover from this war. Let's thank David for his time. Thank you.